whenever you listen to music, and I don't really care what your genre is, whether it be gospel, southern gospel, quartet, contemporary, even if it's choir music, hymns, you name it, there seems to be a problem with Christian music. Now, the reason why there's a problem with Christian music is because there's a problem with professing Christians. The reason why there's a problem with professing Christians, because there's a problem with people. And the problem really is not so much with the people and not so much even with the professing Christians. Probably more likely it's a problem or a fault of the church, us as believers. Why? Because we seem to have, one, lowered our standards, and then two, also lowered what we have accepted. In other words, we tolerate an awful lot of things that we probably ought not tolerate. And there is just this thing that's happening in praise and worship circles, in Christian music, but really, before it gets there, it starts off at the church. Why do I say that? Because anybody who can play the guitar, anybody that can play the drums, anyone that can sing, they seem to be a candidate for the praise and worship team, for the choir. That's just not the way it should be. It should not be that anyone who can play, anyone who can sing, ought to be up leading worship because after all, we're leading worship. Just because you have a gift does not mean that gift needs to be exercised here. The same reason just because you teach kids in public school does not mean that you need to be the one that is over the youth at the church. Two so totally different things. Now, if you can play and you want to set up a band in the garage or, or have a, a country band, an R&B band, or a rock band, that's fine. Knock your socks off. But in the church, there's a little bit more reverence. And what's happened is because we let anyone come in who does who do not reverence the Lord, then when they come in, they may have some talent. And let's just be honest, there are a lot of talented people who make their way into the church and we didn't check their credentials, meaning we didn't check and see if they have found uh, or if they have the Lord in their heart. And so we end up finding people who can put together some songs well, sing well, put together a nice beat. And what ends up happening is those very same people, they rise to prominence and then lead us, not just the people at that church, but if they become somebody famous, they end up leading us as well. I mean, if the beat is right and the band is hot, I can sing all kind of lines and feel like I've met with God. And that part is true. Just be, it can sound good. It can get your head moving. It can, it, it can even elicit emotion. Let's just be honest. Music can do that. And sometimes the music, we don't even check and know who the people are that are singing and know their background, but the words mean something. They register. And that's always going to happen. There's always going to be somebody who you're going to listen to and you don't know what their background is. It's going to be somebody who you like to listen to and you're not sure if you ought to be listening to them or you don't know that you should or should not because you know their background. But the song sounds nice. Now, regardless of what your tastes are, whatever your preferences are, and let's just be clear, it, there is no such thing as a biblical preference. Pre there is no genre that we know of, at least yet, that's been declared to us or in, that we've been informed of that we're going to find in heaven. Does the Bible teach us that gospel music is what is what we're going to sing in heaven or contemporary or southern gospel kind of country? What about Christian rock? What about Christian rap? Because it's not your thing, because it's not your preference. Well, that's not a reason to not like it or to say that we shouldn't listen to it. I even heard someone say that I don't like some of the new contemporary stuff because it is repetitive. They just say the same thing over and over and over again. Well, that might not be your taste, but guess what? Biblically speaking, we do know in heaven, at least, there are going to be these angels that will be saying the same thing over and over again, holy, holy, holy. And so what it boils down oftentimes with some people is a preference. But more than preference, there's still a problem in Christian circles. Now, before we get to the problem, you need to decide, hey, is it OK if this preference that I don't like, is that OK? What about contemporary music? <laughs> Let's be honest, a lot of us, these songs are catchy, they sound nice and so forth. So I like, I like, I like those. That that moves me, it gets me moving and so forth, it gets me, puts a smile on my face. Some folks, that's not my preference. That my my preference, what I really like, what I really like are the hymns.
one of the things we have to do as a body is figure out what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what makes something acceptable and what's not acceptable. Because sometimes the question is, are we going too far with the music? Are we going too far with, with the lights? When you look at some of these things, it, 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 this might be a little bit too much. The lights, the, the smoke machine and so forth. And somebody might even say that this might be okay with the youth, but then again, maybe it's not okay with the youth because if you condition the youth to expect a concert, that's what they're going to want in their regular service. And so is that a good thing? Probably not. Probably not. As a matter of fact, what we need to figure out is whatever we do, it should do what? It should glorify God. Going to the Bible, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he says, whether you eat then, whether then you eat or you sleep, trivial things, things that we take for granted. But he says, whatever you do, whether it's this or that, do whatever it is all to the glory of God. And then he sums up in 33, the reason for that is so that now I'm not trying to seek uh, any, any offense of anyone, but I'm also, here's the other part. I'm not trying to seek my own profit. This also goes with music. There are many people who have entered into the church who are leading praise and worship, who are using this kind of as a stepping stone. But the goal here is not to profit myself, but to profit many so that others will be saved. The whole point of praise and worship music is twofold. One, that we would enjoy it and give reverence to the Lord, that we would let him know how much we think of him. And I've heard pastors say, listen, I want you to put your all into this song. Obviously, we want the, let's just be honest, let's back up for a second. Let's be honest. We know for a fact, we know for a fact that people, if if you go to church and the music is bad, if the music is off, it can throw, throw you for a curve. You can think to yourself, wait a second, ah, you've messed up the whole thing. And so a lot of pastors do want to make sure that before they come up, as they say, the table is set. And so you would even, and, and there, there's some legitimacy to that because if you're going to get up and sing and you're going to lead us in worship, put some time and some effort into it. But what comes across more than anything else, along with practice, is your heart. You should be helping us, leading us into worship. Now, it should not be just the choir on stage. I know choirs are becoming more and more out of fashion, but it shouldn't be just the choir on stage, or the praise and worship or the lead singer. It shouldn't be just them who are enjoying worship, we should too. Remember, we're not coming to a concert to hear them sing. We're listening to them lead us in worship. The Bible says this in Psalm 150. You've heard this before. Praise the Lord. Well, we can just stop there. Praise the Lord. Not myself, not my problems, not anyone else, but praise who? Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expenses. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. We'll probably come back to this in just a little bit, but it's important to understand that we are there to praise the Lord. That's it. Not ourselves. Sometimes we get in the habit of trying to lift ourselves up. That happens an awful lot. We should not do that. We should be there to, one, lift him up, but then also, two, other people might see us. There might be some guests there who hear the praise and worship, hears the choir music, hears whatever, and think, you know what? I like this. Because there should be something about our authenticity that appeals to those on the outside. There are two groups of people, I'm sorry, really three groups of people that are there in the church. Those who are the, the actual true believers, those who are professed believers who might not actually know that there aren't, they aren't, but they just profess whether they do or they don't know. And then those who know that they're not believers, but they're there. And the goal is if we can bring all of us in right fellowship with the Lord together with well, an amen, that's the point. And so there are no individual stars. Now, I get it. Some people have gifts. They want to show it off. They want to make sure folks can hear the golden pipes and hear my runs and so forth and, and give me a solo on the drums and give me a little bit of uh, extra run on this. Watch this guitar riff. No, that's not necessary. Uh, that's not the goal. If in your playing that comes out, well, this is how I praise the Lord. Well, hey, amen. Well, do it in concert with us. We are part of a band and not a, well, it's not a solo act. No one got up to this morning, put on their Sunday's best or just put on their clothes, came to church to hear you give a great solo on the drums. No one came for that, although you may think so. No one came, although you may think so, choir leader or lead singer, came to hear you belt out the greatest rendition of 
uh, pray, praise the Lord or whatever. No one is there for that. They are here to worship the true guest of honor. That would be God. Now, listen to what Paul Washer says. Tell me how much of this, if all of it, that you agree with. You will find most of the texts about the attributes of God in the book of Psalms. Our singing ought to be theological. And if you are going to have a worship leader, he, he needs to be a theologian. He needs That part I agree with. Now, should he be a scholar? No, he didn't have to be a scholar. But he is going to lead us. She is going to lead us. They're going to lead us in singing. And the words that come out of their mouth, that make their way out of their mouth, into the atmosphere, into our ears, and then resonate in our hearts, they need to be biblical. It shouldn't just be, pastor, turn your back on whatever's happening in the worship service or what the choir is doing. You need to make sure that it is appropriate, that is one, biblical, that is doctrinally sound, because we have seen some people kind of go off the, off the rails a little bit. And so I agree with him. He needs to know God, and he needs to walk in the fear of God and holiness, probably even more than the one who preaches the word. It is Now, that's a novel concept that he needs to know God, huh? You mean to tell me the person that's leading or the people that's up there praising God, that's helping to lead us in worship, they should know God? Well, absolutely, they should know God. Now, should they know more than maybe the person that's preaching? I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but they should certainly know God. They should have a love for God. I've seen people with a gift to sing who had no interest in singing, and it, it comes out that way. And I've seen people with less of a gift who have an interest in singing, who is their passion, and you can feel it. And so that being the case, that being the case, I think it's I think it's absolutely acceptable, as a matter of fact, mandatory that those that are singing should be lovers of the Lord. Typically, and we know it, I don't care what color church it is, predominantly black church, predominantly white church, predominantly, we've all had this problem where the choir members tend to be sometimes a little late, uh, to the party and also leaving early, not listen to the, no, you're going to stay here. If there's three services, you're going to be here at all three services. You are going to make sure that, or we're going to make sure that you love the Lord. If you don't, you better fool us. We better, we better think that you love them. It should be that clear, that evidence. The people that are singing should know and love the Lord. It is a terrible thing that we do in churches today with regard to worship because we do not know the fear of God. A young boy has a guitar and he can sing well. Let's let him lead worship. We ought to realize that in the book of Leviticus, God killed two worship leaders because they did not worship him conform to the scriptures. Now, who he's talking about, what he's talking about, we've covered this before, I want to cover this before. Let me cover this. He is talking about Nadab and Abihu. You remember those two boys who approached the Lord with this profane or this strange fire. We're not totally sure what exactly it was, but I want you to go and listen to what Moses says to Aaron. These are Aaron's sons, what he says. He says, it is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, that's what we do in worship, who come near me, I will be treated as holy. So when you come before the Lord, even in song and praise, you need to treat God as holy. You need to regard him as holy. He is not, he is not, Somebody that's there to hear you just to speak nice about him. No, he is God. Not at the BET Awards, not the Devil Awards, not at any sort of award show. You are before the presence of the Lord. That should be known. That should be understood and it should be felt. Yeah, I understand sometimes we're not talking about an emotion, but when you love the Lord and you get an opportunity to demonstrate it in an art such as singing or playing or performing, then you should. Some of you all don't know that I, I used to I used to be over I used to be a uh, worship leader. And you, well, Corey, you can't sing. <laughs> that was not my forte. But what I would always get across them or try to get across is that you are performers, not in the sense that we see in some of these shows in some of these churches. No, you are performing for an audience of one. Make him please understand that he can see through you. He can see through whatever color shirt you have on. Whatever your jackets are, whatever whatever your your blouses are, whatever whatever you're wearing, he can see through it and see in your heart. You are performing for an audience of one. Do not get up before the Lord and tell him how wonderful he is, how great he is, but you don't know it yourself. That's what I mean. And so when you when you get up there, people can see that. Now there's a problem though with the people that we that we pay for their stuff, meaning you can find them on YouTube Music or Apple Music or what have you. There is beginning to be more and more of a problem, and we, it's, no, you're not wrong. You're not the only one that can sense it. You see it on the different shows, and it makes you wonder why some of these folks are even having some of these award shows. I'm the best Christian singer of the year. That sounds real biblical. 
that sounds real godly. No, well, no, it's not. But even more to that, listen to, I don't know if you all heard this. It was pretty recent. Donnie McClurkin giving a interview a little bit about what happens at some of these award shows, these Christian award shows. If you can watch now um, the industry called gospel music today, you see that a lot of it is solely for the aggrandizement. It is for the awards. It is for the popularity. And we use gospel as as the, as the foundation, gospel music, but it, we're building all of this um, carnality on top of it. Who can get an award in? Who can get the, 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 the television spot in? Who's going to be on the televised award show? And, and the like. And that becomes the goal. That part is true. That I, the few people that I do know that have some familiarity with this, that that's true. There's this jockeying in it. As a matter of fact, and I'll go back to him, but the jockeying isn't just with the big people. It's not with the, the famous folks we know, but guess what, guys? There's this jockeying even in the local circus, cir circuits. And what I mean by local circuits, I mean in town. You've got musicians who, there are professional musicians who are paid to go from one church to the next church, who sing, play drums, play the piano, play the organ, guitar, what have you, and they want to be the best in their city. They have these local gospel shows or, or, or Christian worship shows and so forth. They can be invited to come and perform when someone comes to speak. That ha And so there is this jockeying because they still, too, have a dream. I love to sing, and I would love to sing for the Lord, and if, I, if by chance I get paid, then amen. Now, some of those people may have good intentions. The problem is, though, when you have good intentions and you're surrounded by people with bad intentions, it can sell you. Bad Bad company can do what? Corrupt you. And so what he's saying, and obviously he knows he's been there far more than, than you and I have. He knows what's going on, and he seems to be bothered by it. You go to the award shows now, and you, and you, and you um, platform all of the gospel artists and all the new gospel music, and then you go to the reception afterwards, and it's drinking and secular music. You got an open bar, they play nothing but secular music at a gospel award show. So this is this has become the norm because we've let down the guard. The, 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 the guardians have let down the standard. And now there's another standard raised where it's all according to what you think is right. Mm -hmm. And the Bible said there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end of those ways are the ways of death. So that's where we find ourselves. We're singing a great message, but we're not living a great life. How sad is that? How, how sad is that that you've got people there before us while the camera's on, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, praise God, and they can certainly put on a show acting through tears because you can you can generate some fake tears, the emotion. Um, you can just kind of quiver your lip a little bit, go to shaking your hands, and, but then after that, well, who's got the drinks? Where's Where are the drinks at? And then they're playing secular music that that's a problem now there's nobody who we would probably associate this with more than probably these two next people the next people one of them is well our good old friend kirk franklin like Nicky J and Nas, the greatest cake of both the lion and the lamb we're about down to the coat the lion and the lamb we're about down to That doesn't scream Jesus, uh, one, because you, you get too close. That's always been the problem with Kirk Franklin. When he first started off here, especially here in, 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 in Texas, it was one of those things. That guy, he's got talent, but he seems to skirt the world awfully close. He, he, he's too close. He's too, he's too commercial. That's always been the rub. Now, he'll say some things that can minister to a person who is struggling, who is hurting. The problem is Kirk tends not to bring them from the hurting, the struggling, to a godly relationship. And so, yes, God loves you because of what you're going through and, and, and he cares for you, but then it seems to go no further than, than that. That That's a problem, Kirk. Now, what Kirk can do is he can put on a show. This does not look like, if you didn't know it was Kirk Franklin, this does not look like anything gospel. It's an award show. But that is just not what the message you want to be sending. That is not the message that you want to get across to the people. And, of course, we know Kirk is always one who is good to go and dance. Of course, a lot of his dancing seems to be very ungodly, but this is the problem. 
It's a huge problem. You got smoke machines, lights, and so forth. So what is the message? The message that they're going to leave with is that, man, they can dance, man, they can sing. Ooh, we had a good time. We sweat. We did all these things. What were they singing about? Oh, it was gospel. Well, what about it? What, what was the actual message? Well, I don't know. My heart was not pricked, and that's the problem. When was the last time you were at a place where people after, people that you knew were not saved and then placed their faith in Christ after that and then ended up leading that life fully? I don't mean they, they got emotional, the choir sang well, they got emotional, placed their faith in Christ, sort of, at least it looked that way. And then a week later, a month later, a year later, two years later, they have done nothing. They're virtually where they were. They, they made an emotional reaction to an emotional sounding song. Also, there's another person who we will associate, at least especially more recently, with someone who tends to be kind of of the world, worldly-ish, uh, so much so that that's kind of got him in trouble. This particular young man, Dante Bo. I'm excited to just see the performers tonight. So, yeah. <laughs> who are you looking forward to seeing perform? Uh, it's Lil Nas X, Lil Nas X performing tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing that. That's going to be cool. Now, he's at an award show getting his Grammy. Fine, you got your Grammy. And you want to see Lil Nas X? Unless there's a different Lil Nas X, then we got a problem. <laughs> Now, one thing that we don't know or we don't think about, but it's true, there are an awful lot of people who started off in the music industry, got some fame, grew in their fame, and decided because I've been promoting myself all along, the next step, the natural next step is to go into preaching. Have you, have you all noticed how many preachers started off, their background started off in music? Whether they were good at it or not, they tried their hand at music. Some of these people that we know of, people like Lovey Elias, people like Catherine Crick, started off in music. Mike Todd, how about Marcus Rogers? And then this next gentleman, he's older than I am, and he knows better, but he starts off in music, good band, good, good group, commission, and then he goes solo. I'm speaking of Marvin Sapp, who is now a pastor. The problem is, you don't have these pastors doing what pastors are supposed to do, standing up for the gospel, calling out sin and promoting truth. Listen to his response on another interview. I don't know if it's a YouTube station, whatever this is, but uh, asking about or speaking about those who are homosexual. Pertains to um, homosexuality being in the church, uh, and when you study the Bible, you would know to notice that that was a problem. I'm not going to say. Now, yeah, that was a problem. So the issue is, what are, what are you going to say about it? Listen to his, it's not even an answer, it's really waffling. Say, nor will I ever put anybody in heaven or hell because of what they decide to do, um, because that's a God decision. I stand on the scripture in Galatians 6 and 1. If you find someone who is overtaken with a fault, those of you all who are spiritual are supposed to restore them in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest ye fall to that same temptation. Now, the point is, yes, you should restore them with meekness and love. But that necessarily requires that you call the sin out. If you say you know what the Bible says, then it's clear that homosexuality is a sin. But for the sake of me not ruffling feathers, for the sake of me not possibly ruining any other relationships, because one of the secrets is, guys, whether it be in the black church, the white church, Hispanic, and I'm saying black, white, Hispanic church because of the predominant church. It doesn't really matter. I'm saying this cuts across all denominations, all colors and ethnicities, whether it is gospel music, whether it is contemporary praise and worship. doesn't matter. There are a, a, there's a large segment of the population that's in these groups that are homosexual. And they're tolerated. Why? Because they can play what? There's an old saying, you know, back in, especially with the, in, in the black church, the piano player, the organ player is gay. And a lot of times he was, but, but he was good. Oh, he could play. He could, he could make that piano, that organ sing. He was just, he was wonderful, but it wasn't just him. Uh, because you also, you also had uh, the drummer or the bass player who was, he wasn't gay, but, but he was heterosexual and he was showing everybody. I mean, you've got this, this issue with sexual sin running rampant in many churches, music departments, and that just shouldn't be. And you should call that out. 
you should call it out, Marvin, that there's no reason why in the world you don't call it out. You don't seem to stand for sin, but I understand why. I understand because you tend to, or at least seems like you want to be accepted. You want to be part of the crowd, but you know, the crowd that loves the world and, and accepts the world, embraces the world and the world embraces them. And so the money could keep coming flowing. They'll keep buying your albums, booking you and so forth. Yeah. Remember, this is the same Marvin Sapp who allowed this joker into his church and did not refute what he said. Might I suggest to you that um, 85% of Jesus's life, he was out of order. For 85% of his life, he was not flowing in his God-given function. 80 yeah, that's Marvin Sapp's church. And what does he say? Nothing. Keeps his mouth covered. That is sad. That is sad. But it's not just him. Listen, the world is such, especially in, in, the, in the music industry, where we've got people who do not want to offend. We've got people who are more concerned with having their friends in the world not being offended. You all remember this was a few years back, Lauren Dago in her interview about is homosexuality a sin? Do you feel that homosexuality is a sin? You know, I, I can't honestly answer on that in the sense of I have too many people that I love that they are homosexual. Um, I don't know. I actually had a conversation with someone last night about it and I was like, I can't say one way or the other. I, I'm not God. So when yeah. people when people ask questions like that, that's what my go to is. You don't have to be God. And it says that you don't know, well then what are you singing about? What in the world are you singing about, young lady, if you don't know? It's not that difficult. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to be an adult Christian to know that homosexuality is a sin. We've been taught that at a young age, but guess what? You said you she's got friends who are homosexual, that's the problem. The Bible says you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? That's a problem because you don't want to offend anyone. You want to make sure, because again, it's about promoting yourself. And let's be honest, it's not about God in many cases. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And it's getting harder and harder to find enough Christians who we can definitively say, and I'll just, uh, let's just say 50-50, I have no idea. But there's far too many who it's not about God, it's about them. And you even see that as it comes out in their music. Their music is about me, 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 me. Or I may not put it as me, 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 but bless me. And I want to say bless me as I'm saying God bless you. So this is for you. They'll sing things like this is your season. This is God's going to bless you. And oh, by the way, this is one of these other pastors or one of these other preachers who started off as a singer, Mr. William Murphy. I'm sorry, Bishop William Murphy. Yeah, this is my season. Everything is working out for my good. No, that's not true at all. That's the problem. That's how you can hurt some people in the audience by listening, by telling them that everything is going to work out for your good. Well, what do you mean for your good? Well, if you mean by Romans 8, 28, that God will cause all these things to work for the good of those that love him, you need to first find out people that you're singing to if they love him, and then God will cause these things to work out for their good. But in what way, what capacity? If they're going to have a blessing, meaning a car, a new car in the front yard, they're going to have a new house for that car to sit in. They're going to have some new clothes, money. No, no, no. The blessing, the good that might be is that when you get persecuted, when you get fired, he'll give you peace. Why don't you preach about that? Why don't you sing those kind of songs? There are two types of songs. There are the vertical songs and then there are the horizontal songs. All too often, we're singing the horizontal songs. The songs are that about me. And I understand God has done some wonderful things in my life as well as yours. And we should thank him for it. Even if we do so in a song, there's nothing wrong with that. God has blessed us. And there's nothing wrong with saying that how, or saying how much God has blessed us. Nothing wrong with that at all. But we should also sing the vertical songs more than anything else. Remember what we read. Let's go back to it real briefly. In Psalm 150, he says, praise the Lord. Again, praise the Lord. Not you, not your circumstances, not what he's brought you out of, but praise 
God. Praise him. Now, you can praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet. Praise him with the harp. Praise him with the timbre. Praise him with, and guess what? I've said before, I don't even have a problem with you praising him with dance. As long as the dance is for him, not to glorify yourself. That's the issue. We do too much praising ourselves or asking for ourselves instead of for the glory of God. Again, I like the horizontal, I'm sorry, the, the, the vertical songs where it's about God. God, you are amazing. God, you're wonderful. I love you so much, Lord. And those are songs that, that have nothing to do with your circumstances. Matter of fact, those are the songs that treat God as though he is your circumstances. This is one of my favorite songs. I don't know who this young lady is. Uh, I should know by as many as many times I've looked at, the, at the, the song, but I love this song. Just listen to how vertical this song is in what she's saying. Listen to her words. You call the sun to I just I just love that song. That song is awesome. And that song does not seem to violate Philippians 3, 18, where it says, For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even, weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. In other words, they are after their own. They want their own. They, they seek their own glory. These are people who could not tell you or spell what worship is. True praise, true worship, you could do it without, without a beat. You can do it without a piano. Now, in order to praise God, there requires something to come out of your mouth. And God does definitely want you to praise if you have that ability. Even if it's lifting hands, he says, I wish men to all wish men everywhere to lift up their holy hands. God wants us to worship him in spirit and truth. And he wants us to our whole being to be in it and worship. But worship, what worship conveys is this worship conveys a bowing, kind of a bent over um, in adoration, a, a humbling of yourself. And so if the worship comes across as though, nah, it's about me, it, it, it's about me. And we see that often. We see that far too often. But another problem that we see, and this is this is kind of where it gets gray, guys. This is kind of where it was, hmm, I don't know. Because there are some people who have, one, promoted themselves, but also not promoted themselves, but promoted a bad or destructive heresy. Meaning that they, that they go to a place that they are pastored by someone who can't spell Bible, someone who cannot spell God, someone whose doctrine is far off the beaten path. And I mean far off the beaten path. But what do you do, though, when there's some good music coming from it? And when I say good music, if I did not tell you who these people were, you would sit and enjoy the songs that are being sung. You would think, you know what? This is pretty good. I like this. I can I can get in this. Matter of fact, we sing this at our church. <laughs> sang that song in our church and listen one of my favorite songs this is one of those easy songs to sing it's just i exalt thee i listen even in the king james version some of you king james version only is that song's for i exalt thee it's all about him now for some people unfortunately that was bethel the first song and i'm sorry the first both songs actually I'm, i take it back both songs were sung by uh, elevation worship and should we listen to them because elevation sings it well there's where we might have an issue, because what about the hymns? The hymns weren't sung by doctrinally sound people either, but the words resonate. Well, what do you do? 
I'll say this. you got to be careful. If it's you by yourself and you feel like that you are strong enough, well, then eh, maybe. But I think publicly you might want to be on guard. The reason why is because it will lead people to other songs they sing and not just the other songs they sing, but the people who are behind them. One song, if you just go to YouTube or if you're on Facebook or any social media platform and you hear Christians putting some songs uh, to some words, they might put something on the screen and let a song play behind them. Or some of them might sing the song. Is this song by, by Hillsong? Now, what you see now, that song, I'm not even sure what the whole song says because I keep hearing just that portion. And this song one, sounds wonderful. Matter of fact, when you hear the, the audience sing, when you hear the congregation sing, it just does something. When everyone gets involved, I don't care what anyone says, there's nothing like the entire congregation singing. Nothing whatsoever like that. Not just one person, but when the entire audience, the entire congregation is singing, that's really what God is after. The problem is, or the thing is, with this particular song, you see a lot of people, they sing what are called cover songs. A cover song is you take an original song and you just sing it. And so you see a lot of people singing this song. Now, before I go any further, did a wonderful song. She did a wonderful, a wonderful job. The problem is, sometimes we get caught up in just hearing the words or feeling the sound and think, I like that. I like that. That's wonderful. Now, here's the problem with that. And here's the problem with it. And I'm using this to draw out another, a, a major problem, a big problem. You hear a song whether the words are good, whether the words are bad, doesn't matter. The words, the song, all of it kind of captivates. And you think that because it's godly that something's happening, not realizing the effect is not what you're after. What do I mean? Listen to this young lady sing this song also. And I want you to notice the caption above her head. This is a Muslim young lady who sings the song. She likes it so so well. It sounds good to her, but it doesn't move her. It doesn't move her. She says that it's a I shouldn't be singing the song, but it sounds good. So I'll go ahead and sing it. Well, what she's really doing is kind of showing us us because that's what we do here in America. We'll sing a song that sounds good, it sounds catchy, sounds nice. I like the way that song sounds. What's it talking about? I don't know. I have no idea what that song is talking about. Just like the song I said, this ocean song. I never really heard the song, so I can't tell you if the song is heretical if the words are good or not couldn't tell you i just know that a lot of people are singing this song maybe i'll go ahead and check this song out uh, i think i will but the bigger point is people can hear your song and what's going to happen one of two things if it's a good song they'll just sing it but if there's nothing behind it especially if there's no god behind it that that's a problem that's a huge if a muslim can sing your song and not be moved well, we've got to talk We've got to talk. Maybe you need to be put more gospel message in your song. But the other problem is when they hear your song and they like your song, at some point in time, somewhere down the road, somebody's going to be moved to hear more of your song. Oh, this is Bethel. Oh, okay. Well, or this is Hillsong or this is Elevation. But what happens if you sing a good song and then you sing a good song and then they find out who your pastor is? You know, if you sing a Bethel song, and then you happen to go find out, well, what does Bethel teach? Let's go listen. Ah, I like that guy, Bill Johnson. He tickles my ears. Let me hear some more of him. So he was born through Mary, the virgin. And then he was born again in resurrection. The first one to touch him was Mary, the virgin, when he was born naturally. The first person to touch him when he was born again was Mary Magdalene. You've got preachers that just make things up as they go. This is... <laughs> This is Bill Johnson just make, Bill, listen, if you don't know, Bill Johnson should be avoided. 
Bill Johnson is someone who is not biblically sound whatsoever. Now, I told you earlier, we shared, we shared earlier about the problem that you see in the gospel music industry, and someone else speaks about this, and I think this, I think this was fairly recently, uh, a gospel singer by the name of Ty Trippett. He says some things uh, about the gospel music industry, but but something didn't quite stick with me. Something didn't sound right with me. Like I can't, the industry, I can't, I can't do it. It's not godly. God didn't establish establish the music industry. He didn't establish the gospel music industry. It's an industry. You know what I mean? The Lord gives you a gift. And you want to give it back to him and point it back to him. And then you got to place this baby called a song into the hands of a godless industry. So the problem is, and listen, what he says makes sense. you got people who are not after promoting Christian music. They're out after promoting something that's going to make money. And this is a money mover. People are going to buy this stuff. People are going to download this stuff. People are going to pay for this stuff. Okay, well, fine. And I understand. But here's the one thing that every gospel Christian, whatever artist ought to understand. You don't have to sell your soul. You don't have to sell out. You don't have to do what they tell you to do. And the reason why I say that is because you say that and then you turn around and now you got Charlie Wilson from the Gap Band on stage dancing with you. can say what you want to say, but if you're going to speak about it, then be about it. They're not making you do that. And if they are, then tell them no. Then tell them no. You don't have to do that because you're going to give an answer, not to us or to them ultimately, but to God. That's what you're going to answer for. And the question is, who were you promoting? Who, who was you and, and Charlie? Who are you glorifying? Who are you promoting? Again, I hear your point that you've got this godless industry that is taking your music, your baby, and doing whatever, but the songs that you write, so forth, they're not pushed, they're not making you do so. If they don't like it, well then do it independently. Do it, go with someone else. Especially someone like yourself, you got a big enough name where you can pretty much do what you want to do. And the, the deal is that we've got these folks who are doing these songs, such as the Kirk Franklin, such as some of these gospel artists, these contemporary artists who are flouting things and pushing themselves. It, listen, if things of the world is how you are going to appeal to people, well, you have to keep doing that same thing. You've got to keep promoting that way. If you're selling the flesh, you've got to bring out more flesh next week and even more so. Whatever you use to catch people, you got to keep using the exact same thing, but not the same amount. You got to do more and more and more, which is why we see these over-the-top performances, which is why we see these the light shows, which is why we see the smokes and so forth. Guys, I said it before. I'm not averse to doing things that maybe, let's say, the older folks aren't into. If it's for younger folks, let's say, in a, in a, in a youth church or a youth concert, I, have, I, I really don't. But if it crosses the line where it is defaming God or the, it looks questionable, if it gets to the point where it looks questionable, then maybe you ought to pull back. You don't need all of those things. What in the world did gospel artists, what in the world did, did, did contemporary artists, what in the world did, did churches do before we had lights automated moving lights, intelligent lighting. What did we do before we had smoke machines? What did we do before we had indoor pyrotechnics? What did, what did we do? Hmm, that maybe we just praise God. Now, my favorite song, one of my favorite songs. Love this song. Now, it is a, it's, it's, it's sung kind of in a contemporary fashion. Maybe it's not. It's actually a hymn. And I, listen, I love hymns. I would have us sing hymns. We sang hymns. We sang gospel, we sang contemporary, praise and worship, we sang choir music, we sang it all. Every now, every now and then, I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of Southern gospel. Sorry, apologize to the Gaithers, but it's not my thing. Took me a while also to get kind of used to quartet music, but there's some quartet music that, that, I'm, that I'm fine with. Uh, Christian rap, I don't know much about Christian rap. I can't tell you if I'm for it or against it. I, I really don't know. I don't know. Uh, but also, I've been in service where we had absolutely no music and we just all sang a cappella because there's something to just the voices coming together. And I would just try to make sure that everyone would have their preferences met because I wanted everyone to take part in the praise and worship. And what would happen is the younger folk, we had a, we had a mixed group, black, white, Hispanic, young and old. And the, the younger people did not like, did not like the hymns. The older folks did. 
uh, the younger folk like the uh, newer gospel, the, the praise, the contemporary praise and worship. The older folk did not. The older folks definitely did not like the rap. And so we would try to kind of combine. And here's what we would do. Take some of these younger people and make them sing the hymns. Take the older people and make them sing some of the contemporary stuff. And the way they gelled together, because they recognized that it's not the style, it's the words. The words matter. Piggybacking off what he, what uh, Paul Walsh said, you should there should be some 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 theology in your singing. There has to be because we're not singing about any old thing. We're not. This isn't Michael Jackson. Uh, this isn't the Pointer Sisters. This isn't uh, Billy Idol. This isn't Bruce Springsteen. This is God. This is his word that we're trying to convey in song. And so one of my favorite songs, and I'll take us out on this, is It Is Well. I love this song, one, because we've all gone through something. I've even played this before. We've all gone through something. Some of you all know about this story, the story how this song, It Is Well, was written by a man, by, a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. His family, he was, I believe he was in America, and they were in England, and they were moving. While they were moving without him, they boarded a ship, and the ship, as it was crossing uh, the sea, hit another ship and crashed and sank. Most of the people on board died. He gets a telegraph, this was in the 1800s, a telegraph stating that all is lost from his wife. Everyone, on just about everyone on board died except his wife uh, and a few other passengers. So as he's making his journey back home, he's on the boat and he asks the captain, if you could let me know, because they're going the same path, let me know when that, when we get to the point to where the, the other ship uh, crashed and where it sank. Could you please let me know? Well, while he was going, uh, he was sitting in his cabin. He was just giving some thought. And then the captain come and tell him we're, we're approaching the destination, approach, approaching the location. When he gets to the location, he goes to the top and he pins the song. It is well. And think about that for a second. And that's kind of how songs should move you. Regardless of what's happening, Lord, it is well. I know that I'm going through, but it doesn't matter because, again, his singing is not horizontal. His is vertical. In spite of it all, it is well with my soul. Listen to the theology of this song. I sing, oh, the bliss of this glorious my sin not in part 